what I work on is right through to Gandhi. And I've been through classes in this route and I've spent the escrows, but I, it'll still be really interesting to see how we can see how the two systems work to get together. So this first system, this first class, is all about an interpretation and an introduction to what the Italian rapier is about. I call it Gigante. And of course, there are many Italian rapier sources, so Gigante's approach is different from Capoeira's approach, and Fabius's approach is different from a lot of other less well-known people's approach. This is my take on Gigante. Okay, so an Italian rapier is usually longer than it. I wouldn't say it's longer than Spanish rapier. It's longer than the later Spanish rapier that we tend to see represented in the distressed sources. Um, but I would say that the rapier of the early 1600s in Spain is probably quite long as it is as it is in Italy. And by the late 1600s, by 1680, like if you look at Marcelli, the rapier is quite a bit shorter. So, but when people do this distress, it's my observation, they tend to use a shorter rapier. Um, some analysis such as Capoeira would give a typical length for a rapier, which I find a little hard to interpret, but some people think it means it should come to your office, for instance. Um, I like to go with Tibold, who's not really, he's not an Italian source, but he's from um, early 1600s, and he says, the cross guards have come to your navel. So that's a measure I find handy. We typically we use a longer rapier, which has implications for reach. And the grip I would use, Something's called Chiavi Serata or closed teeth. If you put one finger across the cross guard, you close your thumb on it, and you bring your middle finger if it fits to the base of your thumb. And then you can actually hold the sword. You, you put the handle in the, in the gap in your palm here. You can just hold the sword by basically just opening all your fingers except your base of your middle finger and it floats. So don't grip the sword too heavy, hold it loosely. So a lot of people hold it like it's a hammer, uh, but I'm encouraging you to hold it like it's a paintbrush. Okay? So we can be more artistic. So to practice this, we're going to do our first exercise, which is to pull the sword and write your name in the air lightly. Join up writing. And if it comes out in cursive writing, in, in fluid scripts, you're doing it right. If it's Viking runes, you need to relax your hand. Okay? And the second is tempo. Tempo literally means time, and it can mean that in the Italian specific, but it also means the right time to attack. And some masters such as Capoeira would identify four main tempos, four different opportunities to attack, four signals that it's safe to attack. So we're going to go into that. We're going to start with the basic blade engagement, and we're going to go from there. Okay? If at any point you have questions, wave your hand, let me know then, because I'd rather ask questions when they're relevant, rather than try and remember what we were doing there. Okay? Right. So um, I'm going to throw some gloves on, because it's more comfortable. And we're going to talk about how we can fence in an Italian way without getting killed immediately. Um, Roger, would you help? Yeah, of course. And you're probably the one who's going to be right-handed for the moment. Oh, yeah. Because I'm the the guy. That's true. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is be out of measure. We're going to practice this later, but if Ruger sets up in any position... Oh, yeah, I should talk about the guard, right? The, the discussion of fencing involves guards. The only thing to on guard is don't take a guard. <laughs> take a counter guard. Let your opponent take a guard. Be out of range. And then... So out of range means nobody can hit each other. If I do a, a lunge, you can ignore it. Okay? So we have to start out of measure. Or we miss the beginning of the fight. So out of measure, typically the blades might be just crossing. If I want to go closer without getting stabbed, I need to control this blade. And I'm going to control this blade by taking the blade or spring, springering or lots of spingere, which is basically Keeping my weight back and crossing over enough that if he pushes my sword sideways, it's not working. So I have control of the blade. And off the lines, if he goes straight forward, he doesn't have it. So if you'd like to stand on this white line, so people can see that from another angle. So 
Okay, we start on the same line. When, we, when I approach, I'm going to step off the line, I'm going to extend my arm. I'm going to keep my weight back. I'm bending from the waist. I'm not moving my hips. So I'm going to commit my weight. I'm keeping the weight back. I'm bending from here. And then I want to cross over just a little. He pushes me. That's enough. Now he can't control my sword. Then, this is the polite version, I will extend, lean, and press. I'm leaning into his sword, not ahead. My hand is here for protection in the Gandhi approach. Now that I've stabbed him, imagine someone pulls you from the back of your head and pulls your head back. I leave my sword out controlling the sword. I step back. And now we're, we're out of the range. Okay? So, if you swap sides with me. Again, out of measure. I don't want to step and extend. I don't want to do this. Because in that moment, Roger could counterattack. So my foot is committed. That would be dangerous. That would be giving him a tempo to attack. So I want to go to a position where I'm just in range, and then extend the arm and leave the body in. So now I'm ready to act if he's if he Then we do the test, and then I go forward. Thank you. So just to get this, the important part is that when you go and control the sword, you have control the sword. And you can tell it's control. So we're just going to do the drill where we do that first step. So let me once more, just stand this line, please. So the first drill is really, really, really simple. Start out of measure. Oh. And feet closer together rather than wide. Okay, this is the basic idea, which you probably like to do. Okay? Now, if I'm here, my foot puts at this line, and I want to see if I can reach the grip. Yeah. This is right here, so I can reach as well. So if I'm here, and I'm in a wide stance, like you might see in Mark, and I extend and I, I try and reach, I have very little left. If I bring my rear foot up, and I aim off the body, I have loads of space. So your range is determined by your rear foot. So you need to keep your rear foot reasonably close. I would say, about a little more to the length of your foot. So it's basically upright until you commit to a line. If you look at Tigati's illustrations, they contradict what he says in words. They're all very wide. So maybe he thinks this is narrow. I don't know. But I'm going more with my interpretation of the words than measures. Okay? So when we approach out of measure, feet are reasonably close. Weight's more on the back foot, everything's set and level. And I'm going to engage. So I'm going to step to my sword side, extend, and he's going to test. And then I'm going to come back and do that. We're going to do that like five times each way. So it's just to make sure that when we think we've engaged, we have. Okay, so we're going to do that. Make sense? We need to get our engagement safe, and to get our engagement, we need to practice. What are the aspects of putting our sword in there so it gives us strength? Okay? Um, could you help me out? Yes, sir. Thank you. So if you stand there, so if I'm engaging here, and you test, so he can't push my sword, this is a safe engagement. Right? I'm doing it from a bad posture, I'm, I'm just showing the sword there. But, so if you push my sword, see, that was a, an unsafe engagement. So we need this test. We need to reliably make a safe engagement. Okay? So otherwise it's not safe to come in. So we're going to play a game to practice engagement. It's called Hunt the Devil Way. It's something I've gotten from Guy Windsor. It's a nice game. You can play it again without a mask because we, we don't close in. We just go to wide measure. So if you put your sword out. So take control of my sword. Don't step in. Nice. Yep. Just, just, we're just going to play Hunt to keep the sense alive. Engage. Or to me, right? And you just try 
to keep your sword by the side. Make sure you're pushing the sword tight. Does that make sense? Once again, hunt the devil, right? Just do it for like 30 to 40 seconds. Get it feel good, okay? Get control over my blade. Hold the stuff. Without stabbing, just with the blade. Good. So you're pushing. So one thing is the point of connection. It's much closer to his hand. That's mine. That's an advantage for short rapiers. So he will have better leverage, right? However, too much fair connection? Not enough. There's other factors at play. Right? It's not just the how close the hands are. What else am I doing here that's giving me that leverage back? I'm on the top of his blade. Right. So I'm on top of the blade, I have more strength. This is not just the weight of the blade. But it's, um, it's a natural action in the sense, not just because of the weight, but because our hands are stronger going this way than raising. Our muscles here, you use a hammer like this, really like that. Okay, so if we can push down, we're good. The second thing is the way I hold the blade. The third thing is, if you think of pushing me now, the blade is bending, you turn it, turn the true edge. Uh, in Italian terms, the true edge is the forward edge where knuckles are facing. So we need to do a few things. We need to ideally have the point of connection closer to my hand. It's difficult for me to do that with, against a shorter blade. I can do it here. I want it to be over. It means I can't be pointing at Kenny. I have to be pointing over his shoulder. I have the edge pointed at his sword. And I need, well, I just have the edge pointed at his sword. Point of contact ideally near to my hand. True edge. If I have these three things, then I'm pretty good. Okay? And if all else fails, I'll disengage. But if I do this right, you'll have to disengage. Okay? And then I'll re-engage. So that's the plan. Small question now. Yep. Before you go on. Sure. Uh, is it okay to cross the line with the point? It's better to cross the line with the point. In fact, you can't be over my sword without doing that. Here, I can believe it. You cross my line? Now you've got it. Yeah. So it is okay. So you have to cross the line. Yeah. yeah, really good question. And that's something a lot of people miss. Okay, so now hopefully we've got a good feel for engaging the blade safely and effectively. And I know you do some. Uh, to my mind, an attacko is similar in concept. Yeah. So there's different technical ways of doing it, but it's the same idea. So you always control their sword before you go and hit them. It will be different than rapier and dagger tomorrow, where you try and avoid their sword with yours and you control their sword with your dagger. But when you have a single sword, you control it with your sword. Okay? Now we're going to do a drill about what happens next. And with this, would you mind getting a mask? So we're going to do the ideal situation, which is what happens almost never, where your opponent stands there, tries to fight your sword, and you can hit them. So we're looking at what, we're, what we're, our basic attack is. It will really work, but it's a basic idea. And if you can stand this white line in the center, it would be really helpful. So, we're going to take the drill one step further. I'm going to in here, engage, he's going to test, and then I'm going to step through his sword. Not at him. I'm going to lean through the sword, extending first the sword, then my hips, and then when I need to, push in and touch here. So my hand comes up, palm up, we call this quarta, work guard. And then, imagine someone's pulled you by the scruff of your neck, and brought your head back. So the head comes back first, the sword stays out. And you come back. So the interesting thing on the footwork is if you put your sword up, and I just do the footwork, when I engage, here, but when I step, I'm stepping across the line. Okay, just following the way the sword goes across the line. My hand with the sword is going here, engaging, and I'm winding up in a curve into the quarter and putting the palm there. So the palm up. So my fist is pushing through the sword, and my sword is pointing here. And as I engage, the sword point goes farther away from me. So this makes me safer as I engage. Then I keep control of the sword. I come back. Does that make sense? Yes. Questions? 
I'll show one floor from the other side, and then we'll go there. In fact, let's do it from different angles. If you go over here, and let's get it here from a different perspective. Okay, red. From here, engage the cat, always test, by the drill, I lean in, put the sword in, my hand to safety, bring my head back, and retreat. Okay? No problem with how to do this as well. Actually, <laughs> maybe it's completely irrelevant to your question, but I thought this step was really weird. Uh -huh. yes. but, but if I if I have to stand the, uh, the, the whole body and let the arm like Yes, exactly. That makes it strong. So there's a few things to just get right. One is, sometimes people have the instinct that you put your sword out that I should engage this way. But if I'm putting Liebig's stone and I'm putting my sword underneath you. So if you look at Giganti's illustration, it implies that I'm coming off the line here. So from here, I'm over you. I've got good Liebig, my head is on you. Then I need to step into you, into your sword. It's very dangerous if people go, aha, now I have to go. Now I'll stab, and I've completely given up my leverage. Right. Even if I keep in contact, I'm still giving up the leverage. So we have to be very rigorous. If we come to the right, but away from the sword, then we go through the sword, and only a pint goes in. The whole motion is through your sword. Including my foot. So that keeps me secure. So I can stab you and you don't get stabbed. Yeah. Which is good, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So now we're going to look at, briefly, um, what people can do against this and what we can do against that. Uh, we may drill this a little bit, but I really want to make sure I use a tempo and measure are keyed in because I'm also going to be using them when I teach ideas for dealing with the strata. So we're going to briefly look at what follows up. So, since you're doing a nice job of engaging my sword, let's have you do that again. And then the second time, I'll look at a counter to doing that. Okay. Okay, so if you again if you step on the front line, it will be just easier for people to see. So we're going to do the drill that just happened. You see it's covered and then engage the strike. Okay. Yeah, sorry. And I'll do it. Okay, and do it again. Right. So my counter is to avoid that happening. Now ideally I could have been somewhere more useful, but it's okay to be honest. So you go to engage me. I do a traction, which is a disengage. So if you do that slowly, traction, you see goes to touch my sword, just drop, open your hand, and then come up and engage across the sword. So now I'm winning the engagement back, and now I'm pushing forward through his sword and doing the threat that he was going to do to me. So I've just stolen the initiative to do that. And the same, the back of the sword. So to practice that, if your sword is out, you're just opening the hand, closing the hand, and turning the edge in. Okay? So, the hand is here, open, close. So it's mostly a V-shaped action. In modern fencing, it's often a circular disengage, but heavier rapiers don't necessarily do that very well. So I interpret it, he goes to engage me, <coughs> take the lever back, finish the action, come out. Okay. So I can't <coughs> let him touch my sword. If he touches my sword, it's too late. So as he goes in to engage, don't beat him. Take the engage. Now he's in range. One one step will do it. And come back. Okay, so just edge in. Make sense? Shoulder on so on her that is behind her sword. So then when I'm engaging, I'm extending into the gun left, and that brings the pint in as I punch out. Okay? And yes, you could try and hand parry, which is a danger also if she has a dagger, but you know, maybe I'll get past that. Either way, I'm safe. Yeah. This is what I need. Okay, and then I can do other stuff. And then come back. Cool, thank you. Um, I'm just going to briefly show how we counter that. Very briefly. I'm going to drill it really quickly to give you an idea 
We're not going to drill it to get it perfect. I just want to get a feel for it. And then we're going to talk about tempo. Okay? We're going to finish with tempo. So how do you count that? Help out. I'll just get my mouth done. So we're going to do, I'm going to engage Josephine. She's going to cavassi only and strike me instead. Then the second time she does that, I will do a count. Okay. So, engage. I'm dead. Whoops. Okay. Again, engage. I turn her. She's dead. No. So, how do I beat the cavassi only? I beat it by taking a smaller motion that is therefore quicker to do. I don't need to be physically quicker than you think. I just need to do something that takes less time. Okay? So the guy he doesn't have a particular term for this. He, he calls it parrying in some context. He just says turn the wrist. So if you do this nice and slowly, I engage, she come out to your legs, I turn my wrist. While she's doing this big motion, I'm doing this small motion. I'm turning the wrist and pointing over her other shoulder. From here, I can hit. And actually, if she's cavazioning and going forward, I might not even need to step, I probably don't. We have slowly, so engage, cavazioning. I didn't step, I had the range. Okay? So it's just, just that. It's as simple as to engage, and do this. And then punch out, and then lean through her sword. Always push through her sword to push it away, and keep control. Okay, that's our last exercise with blade engagement, which is the basic lesson that the guy who gives you on how to keep yourself safe while attacking your opponent. Okay, so thank you, Yusufi. I mentioned tempo and measure in some classes. So we've talked about measure. We've practiced being just outside of measure. Close, you only intermeasure controlling the blade in some fashion, according to traditional theory. Okay? But now we're going to talk about tempo. Um, Capoeira lays out four tempos. And Different masses of different tempos. These are four I will use. A tempo means a time, but it also means an opportunity to attack. When is it safe to attack? Giganti gives us examples of this. When our opponent is within measure in the, the shift stance or the change guard, for instance, when they step into attack. Every time they make a move that we can exploit is a tempo. So a tempo means the right time to attack. So if I if just be to look in here. So if I'm facing Yusufin, there are basically four tempos. The first is called Prima Tempo. The first tempo is when we engage. So if Yusufin is here, and then she steps into engage, this is Prima Tempo. It's the first opportunity. You strike at the gap. It might not always be a gap. The tempo might not always be there, but that's Prima Tempo. When do I strike? She comes in. What did I wait for, do you think? I pushed her in the ground. Precisely. When she's stable, I'm out of tempo. If, if I try and do this now, I'm running into her counter attack. If she has a physical commitment, if she steps, in that motion, I can steal that tempo. I can, I can command as we, as we engage. Notice this is the prima tempo because before we start, don't move. No one's in measure. Out of measure. So, first tempo, or primo, is when your opponent steps into measure. Okay? So, I'm going to run through all four, and then we're going to do some exercises to practice using these different tempos so we get a feel for how they work. Okay? So, that's the first tempo. Second tempo is she comes in here, and now we're in range. We're in measure. We're in like wide measure, which means I can't trust with my arm. In Italian systems, we like to be in lot, wide measure a lot, where with an increase of the push, we will hit. So now, how can I, where's the opportunity to hit her? If she changes her guard, she's not likely to, but she could. She could, yeah, make some movement on the blade, and if she does, I could hit her. But the most likely situation is that um, I control her blade. What's she going to do? Right. When she cavaciones, that's the mezzo tempo, middle. Middle means in the middle of her action. So I force her to the only, make her do something in my, in my measure, then I can hit her in that time. Okay? So other reasons. So you basically call that me mixing with. Yeah, as you make the action. Yes, I interrupt your action. So by doing the action, you give me a tempo. 
Another thing you could do is if you are here and you step to the side, again, that's taking a tempo. Because as she steps, if she does a non threatening action towards me in range, I can hit. I can strike. Okay? Will you always hit? Of course not. The Gandhi says something like the, the, the art in this is that when we deliver a hit, our opponent takes a hit. Words to that effect. It means it doesn't happen automatically, we have to be skilled to make it happen. But using and thinking about the tempos helps with that. So that's a mezzo tempo. A mezzo tempo is, is, is a, an interruption. A classic example of mezzo tempo is if you're supposed to raise those sources to cut me. As she begins the action, before the cut is delivered, I enter. Okay, you'll see that in Gigante. I'm sure this is something you would not be able to stretch her. Probably wouldn't yes. say so, right? <laughs> Rather would. Yeah? Yes. Okay, it seems a little hazardous. <laughs> um, the other, then there's a contra tempo. A contra tempo is when I'm doing a pass. Okay? And this could be, for instance, um, could be as simple as she's coming in like this with, with a straight engagement and, and trust. And if you do that once more, please. If I can win the bind, that's a contra tempo. If she's making any kind of an attack on me, if she's if she's just constraining me, Mike Ravat's the only in strike is a contra tempo. It's countering her attack. The mezzo tempo counters a movement that's not an attack. The contra tempo is against the attack. Again, if you go to cut me. Oh, Get ready. That's a contra tempo. I'm interrupting the attack now. If I'm quicker, go to cut me. Mezzo tempo. It's before the attack is delivered. If I'm slower, contra tempo. As the attack is delivered. So it's just a way of categorizing our opportunities to attack. And finally, the Dewey tempo, which is double time. So all of these can be considered special tempo, they happen in a single time. The Dewey tempo is when she goes to say, trust, I parry, and I attack. I make two actions. You, you show that cut again? I avoid in my return. So I want you to have a sense of these four tempi because we're going to be looking at different things we can do later against Spanish fencing in relation to what tempo we have. When we first engage, when they make an action within our range, when they attack us, and if we need to like come back, disengage and go in again. How we can use those four tempos to structure how we think about countering a style of fencing. Okay? Any questions so far? Cool. Okay, so now we're going to do some exercises, a short exercise to get a feeling for each of those tempos. It has to be short. We've got 15 minutes left. Okay. So, the first one is, if it's about closing into range. So, if this being and I are outside the measure, <laughs> And it closes this measure, just practice striking at that moment. We're not terribly worried about counter engaging it, we're just working on the tempo. So when you're the person who's advancing, just put your sword out, point to that their sword, and just come in. Right? And as they step in, we're going to take the tempo to the top. So you just be out of range, come in, practice stepping in. It's more about it's more about taking the right time. So we're not worried too much about the exact form you're doing it in. But again, if you do that once more. Control the sword, because otherwise you'll die too. And make an attack, and then come out. The key is, judge when they're, in, when they're out of measure, and as they come into measure, as the foot lifts, you go. So you should arrive at their foot line. Okay, so you move in the tempo of their foot. If you do that, it's the safest way of doing it. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, so now we've dealt with primo tempo. We want to do an exercise on mezzo tempo. Mezzo tempo is in the middle of the action, so it's when they do something. Would you help me out, Robert? Of course. Thank you. Need a mask? Mask is good.
Okay, so method temper would happen when we're just in range and we're doing that. If he's in range, we need to release the steps. That's the method temper. If we're in range, but he raises the sword to cut, which would be stupid, but yeah. it's good, yeah. that's the method temper. So the way we're going to drill this is one person is going to say, find the person in range. Mm -hmm. Finally, I'm just going to say, change guard. Mm -hmm. Changing guard is something people do. If you do it in range, that's the time to find, take a moment to attack. Always attack, controlling the line of my sword. Mm -hmm. So you do this slowly. If I change to prima, come in covering the sword in some way. Okay? So basically, one, per you'll be in one person will move into range. You'll wait. You won't control the first attack in primo. You'll wait, and then I will do something like push in your sword, because that gives you an opportunity to hit me. Okay? And you'll often see people, when they're not sure what to do or how to proceed, they're kind of in range of drill. That's the tempo. If, if you don't have to be stepping, it's better for stepping. So if I, that's the tempo to attack. Okay? So one person will go in, do different things within range, and the other person will take the tempo to attack in a way that controls the line. And if I'm attacked, I will try and, get and just test if your line is controlled. So also work on the idea that not just can't attack him, no. but do it in such a way that keeps you safe. safe. Okay? So that's it. Just attack in a way that protects you from the sword. Do it when you're going to make the move. To begin with, do your control. Do a step. Or change guard position. Do those two things. If you want to, go for a cut every so often. Okay? Make sense? Just yep. give them a few opportunities. Do it for like 15, 20 seconds. If you get a few good in tempo attacks, swap over. Yep. Okay? So you do need to go fast in the commitment of that motion, which we're not really practicing the drill. But to drill it more, you would, when you see the opportunity, go for it. Because that window will open for a short space of time. Okay, we've got two more tempos, we're just going to briefly exercise them both. Okay? So one person is going to throw an attack, and you're going to either take a contra tempo, or you're going to take a Dewey tempo response. A Dewey tempo, because it's two times. So, how would that look? So, um, do a sword, you can help me out. So, uh, I should have a mask, so it's really. <laughs> so, what you're going to do. In simple terms, you're going to come in, engage my sword to hit me. Okay? So, engage my sword to hit me. Yep, you do it against me. That's part of the tempo. Where I come back down there. Another thing I can do is. Alright. That's two attempts. Okay? Um, if you throw a cut. Ooh, I've seen that badly. So that's his book, keep hitting me. Again, please. Let's do it again. Let's stop it. And then move forward. Or one more, please. I've come out of range. Okay? So, last drill of the session. People are going to throw attacks. Please give it with slow and smoothness so your partner can practice taking the tempos. But you're either going to take a contra tempo, typically a cavazione, or a, a parrying counter strike, or you're going to take a jury tempi, which is back off and parry, and come forward, or wide and attack, and go forward. You can also do more risky contra tempi. So if you give me, if you engage my sword and give me a trust again, you can do the fact that. Another so so or stepping off the line at various points. Um, you need to be confident you gauge the commitment of your opponent. So not always recommended, but it's another contra tempo action. Make sense? Okay, let's go. So it's not the Perhaps. Perhaps. Oh, you can multiply the tempo back there. Yeah, so it's engaging. Yeah, okay, so here I am. And you're coming in, right? So I first of all playing with measures. I'm, I'm using the tempo for the tempo. Exactly. Yeah. Mezzo tempo or primo tempo. Because um, I'm often, I'm usually just that side of measure. Side of measure, side of measure. Bam. I came in. 
so I'm stealing, I'm sneaking in. I'm, I'm changing and I'm using pressure. I'm like, I'm getting it moved and I'm frustrating and stopping and starting it. If I kind of see you make a step into that zone, I'm trying to gauge that range. And if I see you step in, boom. And I'm using, using offline step to put myself behind my sword, away from your sword, wherever it is. And uh, yeah, it's basically it. If you look at, um, I know if it came up in the live stream from Minsk, but the final of Single Raker, there's a guy from the US called Rob Childs, <coughs> who plays, just plays like a completely refused guard game, and it worked, worked really well. He's got silver at Minsk. And it's a good example of that done well. Um, but you see many examples. And it is something I would do against the Spanish approach, because I'm refusing the engagement that the FC yes, is simply good at. I, I did notice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for the question.